Welcome into the fourth episode of In the Bag with Unc and Adam. Of course, Unc is Uncle Neely, and I am Adam Munster Tiger from BuffStampede.com on the 24 7 Sports Network. And this is spring break, but we got three spring practices, Uncle Neely, before we had this little break here. And then April is going to be a, a busy month. First off, I want to get your early impressions from those three practices. Now, two of them were in shorts, one of them in pads. So we got to maybe hold back from strong impressions uh, based on the fact that it was a small sample size. But I'm just curious what we, your main takeaways were. Well, I can't hold back, Adam. Uh, I get what you're saying. Scientifically, from a metric standpoint, three practices, one week. But when I look at what was accomplished this week, and I juxtapose that to this time last year, uh, when the bus were going through a first practice, a first week, or first three days, I can't help but be excited. The the energy you see, uh, the attention to detail you see, and not just from the players, but the coaches, equipment staff, everybody, everything has gone up a notch You know, this year, this spring, compared to where this team, this organization was a year ago. Uh, so you're right, small sample size. But man, when you look at you know the connectivity between this time last year, uh, as far as week one, day one practice compared to this year, there's really no comparison from the energy, from the speed, from the size at each position, every level, and that attention to detail, and especially the relationship between the players and the coaches. Uh, I think having everybody together for a school year, new guys coming in January, having them from a strength and conditioning standpoint, you put all in the pot, man, you're a better team now than you were a year ago. Yeah, and, and like I mentioned, they're on spring break right now. You're back in Jackson, Mississippi, and uh, we have three teenagers, and so we're we're in the thick of it right now, and you get to go home and see your grandson. I'm curious, is being a grandfather all, all that uh, everybody makes it out to be? It really is. I, I used to think that, you know, as the young folks say, people were capping when they say, man, just wait till you become a grandparent. But it really does change your perspective on things. You know, to see a life that has come from a life that you produced and raised and to watch them now navigate that parental space uh, and to, to hold that child, which is your grandchild, man, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. Uh, and so to be home during spring break uh, for the for Colorado and be back in Mississippi, man, to spend that time with the family has, has been really invigorating. And I tell you this, man, I've been checking the weather back in Colorado and comparing it to here. You know, I love Colorado in the summer, but, man, you cannot compare spring in Mississippi to spring in Colorado. We've been like 78, 75 degrees at our St. Patty's Day Parade. Been checking back there. It's been in the 20s. So I'm looking forward to going back still. We're getting up there, though, Neely. It's going to be a nice weekend out here. Don't don't, don't think we're too miserable out in Colorado right now. But we're, we miss you and we'll welcome you back in I'm curious what your expectations are when you get back to Colorado, when Colorado and, and the, the entire Buffalo squad is in Boulder. And are there some things you're you're looking forward to in terms of leading up to that April 27th spring game that would signify maybe a su successful spring for the Buffs? Uh, in short order, when we initially get back, I'm looking forward to some ring rust. Uh, you know, it just so happened, man, that after you got a week under your belt of practice, and installations now you got a complete week off and it doesn't take a lot of time to you know get out of condition uh, especially when you're used to that colorado altitude and working out in it you know you take a week at home and come back you got to kind of readjust to it so i'm looking forward to man maybe a little sloppiness on monday or tuesday when they get out there with coach mo or coach prime whether it's strength and condition or actual practice but i think by the time you get midweek toward the end of the week you know they'll be right back at where they left off uh, and then going forward to the rest of the spring, you just want to stack good days. You want to stack good team meetings. Uh, you want to stack good conversations, good installations, because you want to be peaking for that 15th practice, you know, which is what we call the spring game on April 27th, uh, to put on a good showing for yourself and for the fans and everybody. And let's also keep in mind, man, that portal door is still swinging and swinging, going and coming. And so a lot of this spring ball activity is going to be an opportunity for guys you know, who are trying to showcase themselves for their next stop, not only fighting for a position here. It's almost like those final preseason games in the NFL. So I think there's going to be a lot of evaluation taking place, you know, the next four weeks in April leading the spring game. And I think the spring game itself is going to be an opportunity to show that I belong here on this team or it's probably best I go somewhere else. 
I doubt many folks still have this on their DVR, but if you went back and watched last April spring game and then thought about what's in the program right now, may, like you alluded to this earlier in terms of the difference that, that's taken place, this is a completely different football team. Uh, before we get into the fan questions, I'm, I'm curious. And, and again, you, you touched on this a little bit, but just how stark of a difference is that from, from a year ago to what we see right now? It's in every position, Adam, and, and that's not an exaggeration. Uh, Shador Sanders looks better than he did a year ago. Dylan Edwards looks better than he did a year ago. And I'm naming guys that you know are going to be on this team. These are not guys who are going to transfer. You know, Travis Hunter looks better than he did a year ago. But one of the stark differences uh, is when you walk in and you see the defensive line. You know, I was telling the, the D-line when I was doing some filming last week, because I used to be able to shoot them with the camera right here. Now I have to do this to film them. It has been a complete upgrade in size. Uh, same thing with the offensive line. It's been an upgrade in size and speed and flexibility. You know, every position on this unit has gotten better, including the guys that you already knew that were good. So, uh, And that's just the eyeball test. When you walk into the meeting room and just see the physical presence, the attention to detail, the number of people who are in the re meeting room 10 minutes before the meeting starts versus last year, and there were people still coming in two minutes before it starts. Total change in culture and buy-in this year. All right. Everybody's here to get in the bag with us, Unc. So let's do it. At Zill City on X asked, what is Unc's early assessment of the defensive line? Well, just kind of touched on it there, Adam. I, I love their physical presence. You know, I used to always say that I want to have a defensive line that even as a guy inside the room, inside the team covering them, I want to be afraid of someone. And Doug, you got some guys that will make you, you know, you get out their way in the cafeteria. You let them go in front of you because we got some big boys and they look the part. They are tough. They're nasty. They're tenacious. They're competitive. Uh, but you also have a cerebral standpoint to it. You know, you got uh, Shane Cox, who's returning, grad student out of Dartmouth, who just understands the nuances of the position mixed with his physical prowess. I love what this D-line is bringing to the table. You know, there were three goals in the offseason. Upgrade the offensive line to protect the uh, number one quarterback in the nation in Shador Sanders. Upgrade the defensive line, you know, so that we could stop the run and stop giving up big plays at the wrong moment and then focus on tight end. Those were the three things going on. And I think that when you look at what's taking place, that D line clearly checks the boxes and is improved. I think people are going to like what they see. I always like to talk about the the all bus team the guys that look the part that would get off the bus first and intimidate the opponents and you know i'll be honest you know a lot of times in colorado's past before colorado before coach prime got to colorado is that was an easy three four five six names maybe uh, uh to list out there now in that defensive line is a big part of this uh is it's hard to – I would want to sit down and have like a 10-minute thought process in terms of who would be those guys because you, you have brought in so many of those guys that really look the part. Um, when you're in the practice facility, uh, I would imagine from last spring to now, that's a, a, another big difference, just the, the makeup of this team from a physicality standpoint. Oh, absolutely. And, and it goes across the board. Like I said uh, – you know, Dylan Edwards is not only bigger from a muscle standpoint, you know, having a run track this season, he's also still faster. But when you get to down in the trenches, man, physical, they look the part. And, and, you know, here's what I like, Adam. You know, people always talk about, you know, the, the fear factor when that guy steps off the bus, and that's what you want. You want somebody who's intimidating the other team. But here's what I look for when they step off the bus. Does the bus get that bounce when they step off of it? You know, when that big guy gets off, Bus, does the bus go higher because he's no longer on it? We got some guys when they step off that bus, whether it's a home game at Folsom or on the road, you're going to see the bus move when they get off of the bus. Awesome. Let's go on to the next question at SCO underscore buffs, double underscore. This, this guy means business. He's got many multiple <laughs> underscores here. On X, he asked, has Unc seen the new unis? Can't wait for the unveiling. We might have touched on this in a previous episode, but for anybody that didn't tune in, uh, I think folks are anxious to see what the new look is going to be for the Buffaloes. I think we did touch on the episode one, but here's the good news about growth, Adam. As we're adding people to this in the bag, 
you know, they may not have seen that episode. So we're going to take all those questions, even if they're repetitive, because it might be your first time hearing this answer. I have seen them. I've seen varying combinations of them. Of course, they're under lock and key with Smitty, and he lays them out on the floor like Coach Prime used to do in his playing days, so you can see them in the totality. What I like about new uniforms, without addressing and giving away the secret sauce on one in particular, is the many combinations that we can do with them. I really think that this uniform uh, situation, the partnership with Nike, you know, the coolness and swag of Coach Prime, uh, Smitty knowing he's doing down in the equipment room, Man, whether it's face masks, decals, pants, helmets, shoes, I really believe that if if we wanted to, we could go all 12 games and not repeat a uniform. I thought CU's uniforms looked the cleanest in the TCU game. What was your favorite combo you saw all season? No, that, that was swag. That, that was the, uh, the the whites, you know, that week one in TCU. I tell you, man, one of the things I liked was just the simple, you know, that, that gray out. You know, great top, great bottom, man, because it, it had that throwback feel to it, but also has some modern day swag when you looked at the details. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I just think man, there's so many routes that you can go with this thing. Looking forward to what we unveil and win, because, you know, you got week one at home against North Dakota State. Uh, and then you got those road games, Nebraska and Colorado before Baylor comes, Colorado State before Baylor comes. I don't know which one of those four, you know, we're going to roll out. You know, just what we think is the best one. But it's going to be interesting to see what, what breaks out that first four games. You mentioned those games, and my blood is already starting to boil a little bit. I got I got to I got to ease that back down. We got a long ways until we get there. Uh, hey, let, me, all let, right. me tell you, let me tell you something yeah. about those games, uh, Adam, that, that, that people didn't get to see. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, CU hosted a track meet, and Colorado State was there running. Colorado State, uh, the women's track team, asked to take a picture of Coach Prime, to which he obliged and took a couple photos with him. And when, as they were walking off, he said to him, hey, make sure your head football coach sees those. There you go. Oh, man. Yeah. No, that's – don't even bring that game up to me right now because that that is uh... – <laughs> <laughs> too far off to to start having the the, the brain work in towards of towards uh, how exciting that's going to be. All right, at Neek underscore one of one on X asked, do you think Travis's reps should be limited on the offensive side to focus on his draft stock as a cornerback for next year's draft? Should he focus on pro proving he's the best cornerback in college this year? I I, I see this. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna leave some meat on the bone here for you, Neely. But I, I gotta say this before I kick it over because it, Travis is a unicorn, as Robert Livingston said at his press conference. And uh, I just feel like I go back to a, an argument I had on Sirius XM Radio. I'm not gonna mention the host because he's a good guy, and uh, I hope to be on their show again. But he told me last year. Uh, uh, in preseason camp when we were doing an interview that he thought it was malicious how Colorado was using Colorado and that, you know, college football players aren't meant to do this. And it, it, it made me kind of angry in the sense that get on a plane, come out, watch Travis Hunter do what he does. You could even go on YouTube and see what you and Darius and Dion Jr. put out there and just see that he's different. And uh, so uh, this question to me just signals you have not been paying attention. I'm going to agree with you, uh, and, and I'm going to disagree with the, with the question or uh, the direction of the question. I don't want to insult the defensive side of the ball, particularly what it takes – uh, to play cornerback at this level and the next level on Sundays in the NFL. But I would say that when you have the physical gifts uh, and mental IQ that Travis Hunter has, you can kind of roll out of bed and play cornerback. Uh, he is just that talented. His speed, his acumen, his read on the ball makes up for any missed reps on the defensive side of the ball. I think he's doing the right thing and spending more time on offense to improve his stock. Uh, because what you have to learn in the precision of route running and what you have to learn to get on the same page with the quarterback, particularly one of Shadur Sanders, who has to believe in you and know where you're going to be to get that ball there to you. I think Travis should be spending the lion's share of the snaps on the reception side of it, on the offensive side of it, which, you know, when you flip it 
only is going to make him a better cornerback anyway because now he's learning how routes are run and what to look for when people are getting in and out of breaks. Uh, I think you're right, and Coach Livingston is right. He is a unicorn. He's an anomaly. Whatever you think is right for a college football player, you can't assign that to him because this is not a generational talent. He's almost a once-in-a-lifetime talent. Uh, you know, we're fortunate enough, you and I, Adam, with this gray hair that we've seen a Deion Sanders and we've seen a Travis Hunter. Most people in their lives are only going to see one, you know, that can do it in all three phases of the game. Uh, so his workload can't be compared to other people. And I would say, you know, to the person asking that question, that any additional reps, any additional meetings that Travis can get on the offensive side of the ball in the receiver room with Coach Jason Phillips far increases his draft stock more than if he was spending the lion's share just on defense. Yeah, and Robert Livingston also mentioned that he thought, okay, you're not going to be on defense with us every day. How do you want me to package some of – um the, the 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 homework that that you guys get in terms of studying for for uh practice and Travis said no I'm good man <laughs> that was kind of his response and and that that is Travis Hunter right there you know he can wear his onesies playing video games and still have the tenacity and when, when he gets out to their pra to the practice fields and I'm curious have you ever seen him tired I have not uh, and I've seen him injured, uh, I've, and, and, and it's the difference between hurt and injured. I've seen him injured, and I've seen him try to play through injury. Uh, you know, in that game with what we knew to become a lacerated liver, he was trying to get back up and get back in the game. At Jackson State with his ankle issues that came uh, with him from uh, from high school, uh, they got surgery repaired. You know, I've seen him tough through it. He's the toughest guy you know, and when it comes to a fatigue standpoint, fatigue just does not exist which is why he can lead the nation in the number of snaps and the impact he has. And i tell you this, man, when you talk about Livingston, uh, you know, the defensive coordinator, you talk about Jay Field, Jason Phillips is his wide receiver coach. You know, you almost have to put an asterisk at the end of practice when you're tracking, you know, which, which unit got the best of which unit and say, well, you know, offense won today, but Travis did play on offense more than defense. Or defense won today, but Travis did play on defense more than offense. He is that much of a difference maker when he's out there that you kind of have to scale him and say, well, the other side had the advantage because they had him for the most part today. Yeah, I'm curious, uh, was there a unit or a particular player that, that kind of stood out to you during those three practices? Uh, you know, I, I just love these matchups that you're seeing. You know, again, you, you talk about – uh, let's say Travis again, using that example. Think about how much better Amario Miller is getting because he has to practice against Travis when Travis is on defense. You know, and so you're looking for that iron sharpened iron kind of mentality. Uh, I'm also, when you talk about standing out, I'm not just looking at players, I'm watching the coaches. And when you see the creativity and what uh, uh, Pat Shermer, who now has full control of the offense, is doing to make sure the best 11 guys are on the field and utilizing a Dylan Edwards in space versus up the middle. I'm excited about all of it, not just the players, but the play callers too. All right. Buff predictor on S, uh, X asked, Hey Adam, I noticed an uptick in targeting of tight end recruits and transfers. Can you and Unc speak to how that is related in terms of changes to the offense? I think in terms of the, the first part of that, in terms of them, offering a lot of tight end players and they got a, a tight end commit from a uh, tight end that's going to transfer in from Ohio state, Sam Hart this summer. I, I think it's because they simply needed guys at that position. Is there anything more to that in terms of what you've seen uh, from, from the tight end position this spring? And we can always say more. That's what we're here for, Adam, but you hit it. It's where, <laughs> it's where the need was, brother. Uh, I touched on it, you know, a couple of questions ago. Uh, you walked away from last season knowing we need to help an offensive line defensive line and a tight end all the other positions you were pretty solid at or could maintain your own or you had enough in your current room that you could get those better guys better and coach them up but when it came to offensive line defensive line and tight end you had to add by adding. you had to go out and get new bodies and I think that's what the focus has been one a and one b was offensive line and defensive line and that third knee was tight end and you've seen this coaching staff and this recruiting staff go out and address it uh, it's going to help not only in the receiving part of the game with an additional receiver, uh, but it's also another guy who can block and protect uh, the number one quarterback in the nation or, or spring Dylan Edwards, or Alta McCaskill. So uh, it was a need that had to be addressed, man. And I'm, and I'm excited about who's coming in and address it. Any early thoughts on Shaman Mateer at, at that position? 
Uh, you know, none. I, I don't have any, any, you know, checking the wind kind of thing uh, going on this early because I have not seen a lot of uh, the script in that direction. Uh, because keep in mind, even from a receiver standpoint, everybody's not here yet. You know, uh, we're not going to really know what we have and don't have as far as who's going to be on that depth chart until you get to after spring ball, because, you know, some of your top receivers are not here uh, to, to be in that room yet. So uh, as far as who's getting what reps at tight end, I like what I'm seeing when I stand, you know, and kind of be a fly on the ball and watch Coach Brett Barty long to coach him up. Uh, but for me, it's too early to say, hey, this is the guy, that's the guy or, or anything of that nature. All right. Next question is from ODB underscore. I wonder if does that stand for old dirty bastard. ODB yeah, God, underscore. God, okay, does. Please ODB. You know, don't be Odell Daniel, you know, Brown or something. You know, please <laughs> be old dirty bastard. ODB underscore Biza, aka old dirty bastard underscore Biza on buffstampede.com asked, will we see a less Will we see a little less shotgun out of a true Shermer offense? I think what you're going to see is diversity, uh, creativity, and I think you're going to see what can we do to put Shadur Sanders in the best position to be successful, uh, whether that is shotgun on the center, wildcat on the bench, in the headset in the booth. I think everything is on the table because you truly have a once-in-a-generational quarterback uh, I think he is a Heisman hopeful. You got another guy that's even going to be on offense or defense that's a Heisman hopeful. And when you have that kind of talent, man, it ain't daddy ball. It is what it is. You have to make the scheme fit around your best player. Shadur Sanders is the best player on the team, best quarterback on the team. If he's going to be in shotgun, it's because that's what he needs for success or more success. If he's going to be on the center, that's where it's going to work, too. So I don't think there's going to be this 60-40 thing or you're going to chart it and be able to tell which way is which or what he's going to be more of. I think it's going to come out schematically in these installs to say, hey, on this particular play, this is where Shadur wants to be, so that's what Shadur is going to be. Obviously, you have unique access when you look at other college football programs and what Coach Prime allows you to, to uh, see every day. What – from a media standpoint, how, how have you learned to balance that? Was that kind of a learning curve from, from day one? Or, uh, you know, how quickly did you kind of catch on to, to what you can talk about and what you can show? I, I'm smiling because it was a learning curve. And the and learning curve was more so on me than it was on him. Uh, you know, having coached high school football down in Mendenhall, Mississippi, shout out to the Mendenhall Tigers down in Simpson County. I, you know, you just you want to err on the side of the way of not giving away competitive advantage. Uh, and there are aspects of plays that you can show that really don't show the alignment or what the play call was or the hand signals to the play or that kind of thing. And so I'm always, always, always mindful of that. Uh, but while we were at Jackson State, you know, Coach Prime sure was like, no, man, you can you can shoot this or you can talk about that because it's not giving, you know, giving away the secret recipe. But as you know, Adam, having been together with us for a year now, uh, as we get into August, mid-August and then game week, you see less and less of that kind of thing. Uh, but everything you're seeing now is in preparation for spring ball, not necessarily preparation for North Dakota State. Uh, so you're not seeing any secret sauce, so to speak. Uh, but there's always a fine line, man, between, uh, you know, talking about what we're trying to do and accomplish schematically. And I think as you get closer to week one in the true football season, you start seeing and hearing less and less of that from all the internal outlets at CU football. These next two questions, we're going to kind of group them together. We touched on this during our episode that we filmed in the CU team meeting room. But like you said, there, there's some new listeners and we have had our CU spring ball media day since then. So let's revisit this. Aaron Lot 303 on buffstampede.com asked, at this point, the hit pieces that come from the Denver area publications, including radio station journalists, is getting embarrassing. I feel it's a bad look when you have publications from in-state that feed off on taking cheap shots at Prime. CU hasn't, hasn't had this much going for them in decades. You'd think the Denver media would embrace that. And along those lines, a question from OMG, you're dumb, on buffstampede.com. Question for Uncle Neely. Coach Prime is getting lots of flack from usual clickbait national media for his comments about why he doesn't do in-home visits with high school recruits. Is there any media criticism that gets under Coach Prime's skin? Uh, 
you know, let me just stab at both of those in, in no particular order and all over the place. I think that diversity of thought is a cool thing. Uh, I, I get it that everybody doesn't dance to the music that Deion Sanders is playing. And I don't think that makes you a bad guy. Uh, I do think that there are some individual journalists or maybe uh, journalist organizations that, you know, uh, uh, accelerate that and pour gas on the fire and love doing these quote unquote hit pieces just to challenge. But I also understand that, you know, the algorithm is the algorithm and some people are just trying to find a space and some people's only space is negativity. And Coach Prime doesn't let negativity get on their skin. Uh, no disrespect to the Denver market. But he's been in Atlanta. He's been in Dallas. He's been in Cincinnati and Baltimore and San Francisco. Uh, he's been in the New York Yankees and the New York media. What do you think you can say about this guy that's really going to bother him and change the way he carries on about his business? Uh, as he said in a viral sound clip, and I'm paraphrasing, look at yourself. What is it about you that think, makes, makes you think that I care about what you think about me? Uh, so he really doesn't you know, navigate himself to the opinion of others. Uh, he knows who he is and who he belongs to and what he's trying to accomplish with these young men at uh, at Colorado. And he's going to do just that. Uh, as it relates to those home visits, I, I really do think that there are people in this space, whether they're fellow coaches uh, or, or just people in and around college football that forget the celebrity status of Deion Sanders. He's not just, you know, a head football coach. He literally is a A-list celebrity, uh, a celebrity that has received death threats, a celebrity, you know, that has people want to be outside the bus and take pictures and get autographs. So he has to be careful how he moves. And so when people say, and I say that to say that, you know, as he's alluded to, if he were to do one home visit in a town and not do the next home visit in the next town, you know, you're going to lose that other player. The fairest way to do it is to have people come to you and everybody wants to see Colorado. Uh, he has a 90 percent sign rate when people sit across from him in that recruiting lounge and see that beautiful view at Folsom. And I'll add this finally to that, Adam, you know, for people to say he doesn't do in-home visits and he's sitting on the Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon with a CU hat on and that is being broadcast into 10 million homes. He's doing way more home visits than doing the other power five schools. Yeah. And to add to that, Neely, is look at the results. Colorado has on 24-7 sports, when you look at overall recruiting rankings, uh, the prep guys that they're bringing in, plus the transfers, the best class coming in for 2024 among Big 12 programs. And that's who you're competing with. And so they're getting the results. Um, and, and I've kind of said this, I think that there's a vetting process that kind of takes place too when you bring out guy when you when coach prime's not on the road in in maybe there's some recruits and parents that are just looking for a photo op with a hall of famer with the greatest defensive back of all time versus no you got to get on a plane you got to come out here and and so there shows a little bit more intuition on their part to to you know come out and so i think you weed through some guys there um, and, and so there, there's a lot of facets to it. And I think a lot of the people that are really uh, negative about Coach Prime and the fact that he doesn't do in-home visits are guys that don't really follow recruiting all that closely. So it's an easy, again, kind of clickbait type of thing. Um, but no, I, I he's put together a great recruiting staff with Corey Phillips leading that group. And um, I can't remember what you titled it, but the, the feature you did on Corey Phillips and he kind of deflected all of it in onto his staff in terms mm -hmm. of trying to give them some shine. Um, you know, the kind of the culture he's created from a recruiting standpoint is pretty awesome too. Yeah. And it's a culture that coach prime has created. So many people, you know, believe or think that Deion Sanders is a I guy. It's all about him. And he's really a we guy, you know, he, he will, he will correct coaches mid sentence when he overhears him say like, yeah, I'm working for Deion Sanders. He'll say, no, you're working with me. We're in this thing together. And you see that same attitude in Corey Phillips. When you go and talk to the recruiting department, uh, Corey Phillips never makes it about him or his experiences. He's always sharing it uh, with the hardworking men and women who work under him and with him in that capacity. You add all that together, man. The math is the math. You know, so I would push back to these folks who are doing these hit pieces, particularly on his recruiting style, and say, well, if you got a coach that did 50 home visits, how many did he sign from those home home visits? Here you got another coach who's bringing people out to his beautiful campus and letting them see the environment that they'll be living and working and playing in, and he's signing eight to nine out of ten of them. I think you stick with what's working, and clearly 
the way Coach Prime recruits and with his recruiting staff at Corey Phillips, it's working. And I remember the first time I went to Boulder, pictures pictures don't really replicate what you see with your own eyes, right? That That's a different experience. And so you can send videos, but yeah, you yeah. really got to get them on campus. And the other part of it, Neely, is that a lot of these people that are criticizing this don't realize that Coach Prime still has his staff on the road. It's not him personally, but there's that that CU emblem emblem that you got uh, uh, on your shirt there that is showing up at these high schools, uh, and so they're still having a presence in those schools. And it's hey, Great point, Adam. are you interested in us? Come meet Co- Coach Prime out in Boulder, and yeah, so that that has worked out really well for them. Great point, and people also have to consider if I could put a cherry on top of that, brother. No college scholarship offer is real until it comes from the head coach, and so at some point. If you're a student athlete out there, if you're a parent of a student athlete watching this, you have to have a conversation with the head coach, whether that is in your house on the couch or in his office, that conversation has to take place or the offer ain't a real offer. And Deion Sanders, Coach Prime, knows how to get guys to Colorado and get a real offer to them, and 90% are accepting. All right, before we close out episode four of In the Bag with Unc and Adam, let's do one more question here. At Dylan underscore J underscore Hall on X asked, does Neely have a favorite dinner spot? We talked about your favorite hamburger places back where you are right now in Jackson. Uh, what about Boulder? And, and I know Chef Solomon is uh, your, your main guy. Have you had a chance to, to get a favorite dinner spot outside the Champion Center? So my main guy is really hurting my outside efforts because the main guy makes it where you don't want to go anywhere else to eat. But I'm going to flip the question back to the audience. I want to see y'all down in the comments suggest some people for Uncle Neely to go eat with because, as Coach Prime says, Neely ain't going to miss no meal. So I want to hear from y'all because I haven't found the place yet or a place yet that I could become a regular. But I'm wide open to it, Adam, and you can draw that circle. You don't have to just stick in Boulder. We can get out in the suburbs of Westminster and Superior all the way back to Denver. Give me some good eating spots. I've got a list for you, Neely, and I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, add to your comments on the pregame show once this episode goes up here. Uh, I would say in in the summertime, one time you got to go to the Rio on the rooftop because you get a nice view of the Flatirons, and it's not knock your socks off in terms of the food, but the the grass fed beef that they serve there is pretty darn solid. Uh, so it's kind of like Tex Mex type food, um, and, and if you like a margarita that you're not going to find a better one. I love a margarita. So, yeah. Have you have you been to Pasta Jays yet? I have been to Pasta Jays and shot out. It's, it's very polarizing. Yeah, but Pasta J, man, is a good supporter in front of the program, particularly yeah. to the staff. And not only when we're hosting recruits, but particularly the staff, he will he will hit us up via text message and say, hey, man, I know you guys are a long way from home. Want to come out and have a drink and a meal, man. Just let me know. Shout out to Pasta J. So, uh, I do know where Pasta Jays is. I've been up and down Pearl Street a good bit, uh, but I just haven't found that home place yet that the questioner was asking about. And Il Pastaio is a good Italian place right there uh, by the King Supers off, uh, what is that, Arapaho. Um, mm-hmm. that, that's another spot that I love as well. So cool. Well, we got another episode in the bag uh, of In the Bag with Uncle Neely and uh We're going to have a lot more to talk about once they get back out there and start practicing again in April. But I appreciate you, Unc, and uh, this is always fun. Hey, and appreciate you as well, man. It's a wonderful partnership. And we'll see you next week, man, because we're back at it for the whole month of April, ending with that spring game, April 27th. I can't wait. All right. Thanks, everybody out there, for tuning in.